Hey there, Reconciled Church. Pastor Kevin here, back with week 14 in our series on doctrine. Uh, we've been going through, if you this is your first time with us, we've been going through our Statement of Faith, the New Hampshire Confession of Faith, line by line or article by article, and unpacking it and making sure you know this is what we believe as a church, this is uh, some of our basic beliefs and things that we stand on as a church. So if you were with us last week, we looked at what it means to be a gospel church. Uh, one of the things that's involved in being a true church biblically is what we're talking about today, which is taking uh, the Lord's, uh, which is the right taking of the Lord's Supper and baptism. So as such, uh, let's get into it and then I'll talk to you a little bit about it. So here is our article for today of baptism and the Lord's Supper. We believe that Christian baptism is the immersion of a believer in water in the name of the Father and the Son and the Spirit to show forth in a solemn and beautiful emblem our faith in a crucified, buried, and risen Savior with its purifying power that it is a prerequisite to the privileges of a church relation and to the Lord's Supper in which the members of the church by the sacred use of bread and wine are to commemorate together the dying love of Christ proceeding always by solemn self-examination. Okay, as usual, that's a mouthful. What's it saying? Well, one of the things we want you to understand as we kind of go into these things is, um, I may have mentioned this last week, but Jesus didn't put up, uh, a bu didn't institute a bunch of like rules or, or and regulations. He didn't put up, he didn't start any, uh, a lot of rituals when he was on the earth. He didn't say, hey guys, uh, I know you do the you, you do these Jewish feasts, these uh, ceremonies, and here's like 75 more things you can do. Rather, Jesus only instituted two rituals uh, during his in earthly ministry, and that's what these are: the Lord's Supper and baptism. Uh, and these things go together. And to some extent, I like to think of them as being an initial confession of faith and reaffirming that faith. So that's why we take the Lord's Supper every week. Baptism is a sign of saying, I have trusted in Jesus for salvation. I am follow I want to follow Jesus. And the Lord's Supper is a way that when we take it as a church, we're saying, I still am trusting in Jesus. I am still confessing faith in him. Uh, when I was a kid, specifically when I was a teenager, um, I would go to camps and things like this, like youth camps. Uh, and they're really cool, but one of the things they were really big on is they talk about recommitments. And what what a recommitment was was like saying was generally speaking, it was like saying you were a Christian, you had made a profession of faith, and then you went and you screwed up and you did a bunch of dumb stuff, and now you were turning and repenting from that, which is good. That's awesome. We should do that. Um, the problem was when I was a kid and we did that is that was something you did at camp once a year. That's not the way it's supposed to be. Things like confession and reaffirming our faith in Jesus, recommitting our faith to Jesus, should honestly be a weekly, daily, sometimes uh, sometimes depending on where your faith's at, you got to do it. Uh, it. It needs it's something we should be reaffirming multiple times a day, okay? Uh, we are always in need of the gospel. And so taking the Lord's Supper together reminds us of that. It's a way of kind of like doubling down on our baptism, so to speak. So uh, one of the things as we get into this, to this, it's important to understand is that that baptizing people, um, specifically baptizing believers, is part of our God-given calling and purpose. Jesus left, the, the, it's part of the Great Commission. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 28. He said, uh, verse 18, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. So that's our marching orders. Go and make disciples of the nations. How? He says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So one of the ways we make disciples is by baptizing them. As it, like I said, it's really a way of showing uh, who is and who is not a disciple of Jesus. Uh, those who are not uh, who are not willing to be baptized are not willing to be recognized for their faith in Jesus. So Jesus says, if you want to be, uh, you should make you should make it known 
uh, that you are my disciple. And the way that we do that is by being baptized. Uh, it's kind of like <laughs> a, a believer who has never been baptized and has no desire to be baptized is kind of like a guy with a girlfriend who doesn't want to admit that they're going steady or something and is essentially like, oh, why do we got to put labels on it? Why do we got to put labels on it? No, 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 no. You put a label on it. You make it official. Being baptized is making it official. So a couple things that are involved in this description of baptism and the Lord's Supper that I want to unpack for you guys. Uh, first off, we are credo Baptist. What does that mean, credo Baptist? What it means is that we believe in believer's baptism. We believe that a person expresses faith in Jesus and then they should be baptized which goes to say that we do not practice what we would call infant baptism here. We don't take babies, and we don't baptize them. Um, I, was, I was born uh, and first raised in a Catholic church um, during a period of time. Uh, as a young adult, I was a part of a Presbyterian church, and so I understand uh, different, and Catholics and Presbyterians don't necessarily believe the same things about baptism, but they both practice infant baptism. Uh, why do we not do that? Well, because we look at uh, the examples of baptism that we find in the New Testament, and what we find is that repentance and faith always go alongside it. Uh, people hear the gospel, they receive the gospel, and then they're baptized. So let me read for you. Um, I'm just going to basically go through a bunch of examples through Acts and kind of talk about that, and then I'll kind of try to explain this. So uh, in Acts chapter 2, verse 38... Uh, this is Pentecost. Peter says to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is, or Peter is saying, Believe in Jesus, repent, and be baptized. Be recognized, bapti uh, be recognized uh, with Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. So we see that baptism and repentance go together there. People turn away from their sins and are baptized baptized. Um, bab this is also, you can see the, the other way you would also often read this in the New Testament is words like repent and believe. It's the same idea. Baptism is a sign of belief. Um, in Acts chapter 8 verse 12, we have Philip and uh, it says, when they believed Philip as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, so he's preaching the gospel to him, it says they were baptized, both men and women. Notice that, the, that baptism here follows after the uh, the preaching of the gospel. It, it's, it, it's when the good news is heard and it's received, we see people getting baptized here. Um, I want to point out something else here. Um, so if you come from a little more of like a Presbyterian background, specifically I'm thinking of, uh, maybe if you come from a Lutheran background or something else, uh, and they practice infant baptism, one of the things you probably heard is the idea that baptism is the New Testament equivalence of the Old Testament rite of circumcision. Um, now, there's some, there, there's definitely a correlation you could, you can notice there. Uh, uh, being circumcised was a way that males showed that they were part of God's people, Israel. If you were Going to be an, uh, if you were male and you were going to become an Israelite, you had to be circumcised. However, we don't simply the the and so the argument goes: Well, they would circumcise infants. Why wouldn't we circumcise or why wouldn't we baptize children? Now, here's the thing: Notice here that they don't just take an old now. I don't think that there's an exactly one-to-one -one, uh, correlation there. They're similar, but they're unique and different also. But also, you don't take... Sorry, my phone's on, and I need to turn that thing off. Um, you don't take an Old Testament ritual and then pour all... and change the ritual and then pour all the requirements or the guidelines for it into the New Testament ritual. That would be silly. For example, what we see here is that it's not just males who are baptized, but men and women who are baptized. Now, same idea if uh, this, this shows to some extent differences between how baptism worked and how circumcision worked uh, in the Old Testament. And so same kind of idea. I still didn't turn my phone off. I'm an idiot. I didn't hit the right thing. Sorry for the dings in the video, guys. Um, 
So same idea. We also then wouldn't say, well, they circumcised infants, therefore we would baptize infants. That's not how it works. We look at, um, we look at how the, the um, act of baptizing is used in its context in the New Testament. And what we see is that it's always preceded by the preaching of the gospel. It's always, uh, it always comes up alongside things like repentance and faith or belief. Um, so just wanted to point that out as we were going along. Okay, uh, there's the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch uh, in also in Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, verse 36, uh, it says, And as they were going along the road, they came to the, some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? Now, full disclosure, verse 37 is probably not found specifically in, in your Bible, it's probably on a little thing at the bottom of it, which will tell you this. Some manuscripts include this line. Verse 37, And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he replied, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Then back to verse 38, which should be in your Bible, it says, And he commanded the chariot to stop, that they both went down to the water, Philip and the eunuch, and baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Okay, so what I want to point out there is, yeah, now, I'm not saying we have to put that passage in. That passage may have been added uh, at a later date uh, as a later manuscript. However, what it clearly shows is that, the, is that some of the translators wanted to emphasize the connection between faith and baptism. So, also, clearly, the eunuch already had the gospel preached to him, and he clearly believed. So, even if that, te that text is not, uh, should not be specifically in the scripture, the idea behind it still is. And the fact that some manuscripts include verse 37 suggests that that was a clear understanding of how that would go. Now, uh, Acts chapter 10, verse 47 and 48, it says, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be, to be baptized in the Lord, name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they asked him to remain for some days. Okay, so here's the thing. We have people who have believed and received the Holy Spirit, but they have not, they've basically not heard all of the gospel. And so they have not heard uh, to some extent that what they were supposed to do is be baptized. And so recognizing that they are that they had received the Holy Spirit, which is a sign of God's approval and that God has uh, sealed them uh, for salvation, they said, yes, they should still be they should be baptized as well. This is important to understand. It's not to say that you have to be baptized in order to receive the Holy Spirit. Also, it does it's not to say that baptism makes you a Christian, which we'll get to in a minute uh, more about what that looks like. Um, Acts chapter 16, verse 32 through 34, it says, And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and his family. Then he brought them into his house and set food before him, and he, had, he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. Okay, this is the uh, soldier uh, who basically uh, takes him into their house, I believe, and water, and, and such, and he hears the good news, and he believes, and him and his whole household are baptized. Now, what some have tried to argue is, we'll see some of his house, it doesn't specifically say every single member in his household believed, but it says they were baptized. So maybe we wouldn't necessarily have to practice believer's baptism. Guys, that's an argument from silence. You cannot make the argument based on the absence of evidence. You make the argument based on the evidence you have, okay? So anyways, but what we clearly see here is at least in what in the case of the, uh, uh, of the head of the household, he was a believer. And it stands to reason, do you think he went home and said, be baptized, but didn't share the good news with him and why they should be baptized? Like it was just some crazy thing. Like if you just, you know, if I walked in at my house and everyone at my house is asleep at like midnight and said, wake up, wake up, we're all going to be baptized. Why? Well, I believed, but I'm not going to tell you what I believed in. No, no, no. There's no reason to sit there. The argument that this, that there was not actual faith when they heard the gospel is an argument from silence. All right, let's keep going. 
Acts chapter 18, verse 8, Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. Now notice this is similar language. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed as did the rest of his household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. So, idea, belief and baptism go together. That's why we practice believers' baptism. That's also why we don't practice infant baptism. Um, because we see it as an evident, we see it as an argument from silence, and we want to believe in the clear teaching of Scripture, not the things which are, which may or may not be the case in the Scripture. So that's why we do that as a church. That's why we're a Baptist church. All right. Second thing: baptism in the Lord's Supper as a symbol or an emblem, as we've also heard it mentioned here. So, what we would say is that baptism in the Lord's Supper represent something bigger than themselves. So on surface level, it's just water and a person um, or, you know, bread and juice. Uh, we do juice because kids take wine. And we just, I don't know, uh, comes from the same thing, which is a grape. And uh, the ferment, there's nothing that specifically uh, seems to require it to be fermented uh, in this case. But who knows? Maybe, maybe I'll find out it is. Maybe we'll change our mind down the road. But we, we usually just take, uh, the, we take the fruit of the vine uh, in doing this. So, anyways, what we do, what we don't believe is that those things are. Uh, we don't believe in what uh, the Catholic idea of uh, transubstantiation, uh, the idea that the elements themselves become the body and blood of Christ. Rather, what we're saying is these things represent something bigger than them. It represents the body of Christ, the blood of Christ. Baptism represents being cleansed of our sins by God. Um, and so this is a way we often say um, that you'll often hear us say things like baptism in the Lord's Supper, especially baptism, is an outward sign of an inward truth. So my heart has changed. I have expressed faith in Jesus. But faith is like, kind of an intangible thing you can't just like see in my heart and see oh he he believes instead how do you know i believe well you know it because i've shown it through the act of baptism uh let me give you some passages here first peter chapter 3 verse 18 through 22 it says for christ also suffered for our sins the righteous for the unrighteous that he might bring us to god being put to death in the flesh but made alive in the spirit in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison that's a cutting room floor discussion for another day. Because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. So, just as Noah was brought safely from God's wrath through water, it says, verse 21, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Okay, so baptism represents something bigger than you. It's not just the removal of dirt from the body. It's a spiritual cleansing. It's uh, an appeal to God for a clean heart or a good conscience, as, first, as, as uh, we read in First Peter. And then let's talk about the Lord's Supper. Luke chapter 22, Jesus is giving the Lord's Supper. He says, For I tell you that from now on I will not drink the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. And then he says, Do this in remembrance of me. And so the Lord's Supper is taken in memory of the act of Jesus' blood. It is not physically Jesus' blood uh, and his body. Uh, this is kind of an interesting thing. Uh, the early church, one of the rumors of the early church among uh, the, the unbelievers, the pagans, uh, was that they were cannibals. And they'd say, oh, well, they, they eat the body and blood uh, uh, of their Savior. And what they, they didn't understand, uh, they didn't understand the ordinance. They didn't understand the Lord's Supper. And so they just heard this idea of eating the body. And so this weird rumor started out that, like, all these Christians are cannibals, which I find just hilarious so anyways christianity does not teach cannibalism all right next thing baptism is the beginning of church membership okay so 
in order to be an actual member of reconciled church, you have to have uh, made a profession of faith through baptism. That doesn't mean you have to have been baptized here. Okay, it doesn't mean you have actually had. A, it doesn't mean you have to have been baptized at reconciled church, but you need to have made a profession of faith, and specifically a profession of faith through baptism. Now, let me explain why. Give, let me give you a verse. First Corinthians chapter twelve, verses twelve through thirteen. The apostle Paul writes, "For just as the body is one and has many members, all the members of the body, that is the body of Christ, though many are one body, so it is with Christ." Verse thirteen. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Okay? So, baptism. We talked a little bit about this last week between the difference of like the universal church or the invisible church and the visible church, the universal church and the local church. Baptism is a sign that you are recognized with the universal, the invisible church, the, the un every Christian everywhere who has ever believed in Jesus, you are recognized with them. You are part of one body with them. Now, the question is then, why would we then, uh, if, if it's a sign that you're a part of the bigger church, why would we not require those who are part of a local church, which is also part of that bigger church, to have been baptized? Now, that's why we do this. So, therefore, like someone might ask, um, I have three kids. So I have three kids at church. One of which has been baptized, two have not, uh, because one's a baby, and the other's like four years old. He's learning. He hasn't made a profession of faith uh, yet, and he hasn't acknowledged, like, hey, I want to follow Jesus. Uh, I'm praying for him. I'm teaching the gospel. But if someone said, is Killian a member of of reconciled church? I'd say reconciled church is his church, maybe. Uh, that's where he goes, but no, he's not a he's not a member of our church. He's not a member in that sense. Why? Because he's not a uh, he's not a baptized believer. Um, he might be wrestling through. I'm sure he's wrestling through things in his head. I'm sure he's always wrestling through things in his head. Uh, but he might be wrestling through the issue of faith. But he hasn't come to that point yet where he's ready to make a profession of faith. And so those who are uh, there's certain benefits that come with being the member of a church. There's also certain responsibilities which which come with being a member of a church. We're responsible for holding each other accountable, encouraging one another's faith. Uh, we take the Lord's Supper together as one body. That's why uh, people who have not been baptized don't take the Lord's Supper. Uh, you'll see that some of our kids who have been baptized will come out, even if they're in their kids' ministry, they'll come out and take the Lord's Supper with us. Why? Because they have been recognized with the uh, body of Christ. Now, uh, I should also add, we are still formalizing all the details of like formal church membership, which we will have for you soon. So if you go, well, none of us are official church members, our understanding is that if you are a um, if you are a member of the church universal and have expressed this through baptism, if you are a member in good standing uh, with a gospel preaching church, you are able to take the Lord's Supper. So if someone comes from out of town and they're a Christian and they want to take the Lord's Supper, I don't go, no, 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 you can't do that, okay? When my parents visit, I don't say, guys, don't take the Lord's Supper because this is not your local church. We would say that we've been baptized into one uh, body, therefore we take the Lord's Supper as uh, as a sign of church membership. I feel like I just rambled on a little long on that point. Anyways, because that was about baptism even. Uh, last thing, the Lord's Supper leads us to consider our commitment to Christ. Okay, so... The reason we take the Lord's Supper every week is because it always is proclaiming the gospel. It is always directing us back to the gospel. Um, I've talked about this before. Uh, taking the Lord's Supper every week keeps us honest as a church, so to speak. It makes sure no matter what I say. Now, if I teach a, just a horrible lesson one week, which I try not to do, but I'm sure it has happened or will happen. But let's say I just teach a horrible lesson one week, and it, and it's just gospel is and what it is. Oh, trust me, guys, I try not to do this ever, but let's just say it happens. Even still, taking the Lord's Supper means we proclaim the gospel. I explain it to you. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples and said, take it, eat, for this is my body. Um, and he took a cup, he passed it to his disciples and said, 
uh, take and drink. This is the blood of the new covenant, okay? So by doing that, we are explaining the gospel. We are making it known. So that's why we take the Lord's Supper every week. But not only that, taking the Lord's Supper comes with a responsibility. It requires that we don't do it half-heartedly. Let me give you an example from 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 11, it says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. God is serious about how we take the Lord's Supper. Therefore, he says, let a person examine himself. What are some wrong ways you might take the Lord's Supper? How, what, what's an inappropriate way of doing it? Well, one is not as an act of faith. Not taking it in faith is uh, a sign of, uh, is the wrong way to take the Lord's Supper. This is why I'll often bar, I would do what's called barring the table. I'll say, hey guys, if you're not a Christian, if you've not made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ, don't take this. Okay, this is something Christians do. Why? Is it because I'm simply, uh, it, it, why am I doing it? Well, it's because I'm looking out for that person. I don't want them to take in, in an unworthy manner because God takes serious those who, who do this. What they're doing is, if they're not doing this in faith, what they're doing is uh, they're, not, they're basically pretending they're a Christian when they're not a real Christian. We don't want to do that. We want you to take it on the right terms, as I'll often say. We want to take this with you, but we want to do so on the right terms. Um, also in Corinthians, one of the things is, is people were not taking it as one body. Instead, there was a division. Basically, uh, when they took the Lord's Supper, it was like a meal. And so what they were saying is basically, hey, the guys who take this, uh, we'd let, they, basically there was partiality in the taking the Lord's Supper. And there should be no partiality of the taking when we take this supper. Uh, in their day, they had slaves and free men. We don't have that here in America right now. But they basically slave masters and free uh, masters, slaves, free men. All those guys took it together as we're meant to take it as one body, saying we are all brothers in Christ and on the basis of the th same thing, which is the blood and body of Jesus Christ in our place, the life of Jesus in our place. And so, when people that's uh, it, when we malign that, when we when we take it outside of the message of the gospel, it, what we're doing is is we're um, distorting the gospel. And Jesus takes that seriously because it's the only message that can save people. He says, "Don't take this in a manner that throws people off from the true message, which alone can save them." When you take this, it's a beautiful thing, but take it in remembrance of what I have done. Take it in tr spirit and truth. Take it in having considered your own uh, heart in such a way that people will see it and be led to faith by that act, by our act of faith. So, <sighs> a little bit of a longer one this week on that. Uh, we only got four more of these to go. I'm going to have to think of a new video lesson series after this. I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, so anyways, guys, God bless. I love you. I'll see you soon. Take care.